much. I, I always say when people applaud first that you'd better wait until what you, uh, what you get before applauding. And I always think it makes sense to applaud at the end if you feel so inclined. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I certainly enjoyed the, uh, the drive over today and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, telling you some of these uh, interesting subjects and uh, topics, general topics in astronomy and ones that also are uh, contained in my own research interests. Now, um, one of the things I, uh, we had a talk here in Roger's class before about the space program and astronauts, and with this microphone, I feel as wired up as one, and uh, I had the um, system here uh, explained to me a little bit earlier, so I'll try and run the light show properly, but if things get a bit confused, uh, you'll uh, uh, please bear with me. Um, the this is a picture of the sun. This is going to be the, uh, the subject of my talk tonight. And often when you uh, deal with astronomy classes, it does, the, these astronomy classes don't deal at a great, uh, in great depth with the sun because one often doesn't think of it as being one of the exciting, trendy, modern subjects in astronomy. Uh, it kind of sits there and shines and is nice, but it doesn't seem to do anything that uh, is uh, particularly notable for us. Um, I thought it was interesting, one of my hobbies is uh, Greek and Roman philosophy, and I was reading an essay written by the Roman philosopher Seneca in which he was commenting on this, in which he says that things don't get noticed unless they change. The things that are always constant just get taken for granted. And so he said the sun doesn't have any observers unless it's in a state of eclipse. So I thought that was a good comment to, to illustrate that in a lot of ways we just take the the sun for granted and don't think of it as something that has a, uh, a lot of implication for our daily lives or astronomy in general. Now the main theme of the uh, uh, lecture tonight is going to be uh, twofold. It's first of all is going to illustrate some of what I think are the interesting and in fact fascinating uh, aspects of the sun. And then I'm going to go on to show how it really does have a practical influence on, on our lives here on earth that is tied up with a lot of technologically important issues like survival of astronauts in space and communications. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll uh, mention a little bit of, of how it is very, the nature of the sun, its constancy and the nature of its emission is tied up very closely with the subject of global warming, which of course everyone is, uh, has heard about uh, today. So I'll start out just with this, uh, this picture here which shows the sun. I'll be returning to that a little bit later. But uh, first of all, I'd like to do is to describe a little about this object and what we know about it from, uh, from, current, day, uh, uh, from current astronomy. And so what I'm going to do in the course of about five transparencies is to give you kind of the postcard summary of uh, what modern astronomy has been able to um, uh, f figure out about the sun. If we could have that off, Roger, I'll go to this. Now these facts, I make my living uh, largely out of teaching freshmen at the University of Iowa about astronomy, freshmen non-science students. And so the facts on this transparency are things that I tell every year and they still never fail to amaze me when you start thinking about it. So let's start out with just how far away is the sun, the, the distance. I mean, you look at, look at it in the daytime sky and it seems right there. But it's very large, by any, it's at a very great distance by any kind of standards we're used to. And in fact, when you're trying to convey how far away the sun is, part of your problem is it's hard to get a, a grasp on anything by comparison. So what I have here are indicators of the diameter of the Earth. Okay, we have some sort of notion of that. 7,927 miles, so that's the diameter of the Earth. The distance to the moon is 239,000 miles. It's a 30 times the diameter of the Earth. That's the furthest that we've been able to send spaceships with people in it. Now the sun, on the same ship, is 93 million miles. Now, one of the problems in astronomy that we, uh, uh, that we always have is trying to, the numbers rapidly get so big that you have a real rough time communicating them. So one of the ways I uh, say this is to how fast, uh, how long would it take you to get there in a Boeing 737? If you go to the Des Moines airport and uh, take a plane, it's probably going to be a Boeing 737. You can be in about two hours on the west coast. If you could take this thing and, and turn it in the direction of the sun, 
and ignoring small technical problems such as Boeing 737s don't fly in a vacuum very well, but if you could go at the same speed, it would take you 18 years to get there. So that's the, that's the distance to the sun, which is relatively close among solar system objects and, uh, and the closest of all of the stars. In fact, the sun is so far away that the, it takes light eight minutes to travel between the sun and the earth. Light, as you may know, is the fastest object in the universe, travels at 186,000 miles a second, and it takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. So tomorrow when you look at the sun, you can think to yourself that the sun could have vanished or exploded like a supernova any time in the last eight minutes and you wouldn't have gotten the news yet. So that's the, uh, the first sort of thing of just giving an idea of the, uh, the general size of the, uh, the, the numbers, the magnitudes of what the sun is as an object um, relative to uh, things we're more accustomed to. Now the next thing, having dealt with the distance to the sun, that we can start thinking about is, well, how big is it? Now, the, uh, the diameter of the sun is 865,000 miles. Now, again, that's a number, it's a big number, and it's hard to, uh, hard to relate to. Now, to give an idea of how big that really is, this is a transparency or a picture that I show in my astronomy class, and I always just refer to it as the famous picture because uh, over a course of about six weeks in the middle of the semester, this appears almost every day. And uh, by about the, uh, towards the end of the semester, the students will audibly groan when this thing comes out. And I think it's burned into their, uh, into their memories. But the reason I do this is that there's a lot of information on this transparency. And so it shows the relative sizes of various solar system objects. And by looking at it, it really gives you an interesting feel of how these various kinds of objects relate to each other. So here is a ball representing the size of the Earth right here. And we have another uh, ball very similar in size representing the planet uh, Venus. Mars over here is, of course, one that's uh, in the news a lot, but you can see it's definitely a much smaller object. All of these planets are really uh, very small compared to the, uh, what we call the Jovian planets, which are planets like Jupiter and Saturn. But they, in turn, are absolutely tiny compared to the sun. So here is what would represent the edge of the sun there. So the sun is an astronaut as an object in terms of a, a, uh, a physical object is more than 100 times the diameter of the, uh, of the Earth. So we're talking about things of like the difference between the relative size of a basketball and a pea or something of that sort. So the sun is very far away and is huge in extent, like I say, 100 times the, uh, the diameter of the, uh, of the Earth. Now these facts are really amazing ones, and again, I think I always feel when I teach this class that it's one of the things I'd like to people to really learn after they take a college level course in astronomy is just this basic fact. Now the course that I teach is called Modern Astronomy, but this, this basic result here is not particularly modern. In fact, the, uh, the realization that the sun was very, very far compared to both the moon and any terrestrial so, uh, scales, and that it was huge compared to either of those objects, was figured out by a Greek scientist named Aristarchus of Samos around 250 BC. And it wasn't just as if he sat down one day and said, I'll bet that's the way it is. He actually came up with experiments and observations that demonstrated. It's really a remarkable illustration of um, how clever people can be sometimes. Now, um, the next quantity, as far as I'm going down a list then of the attributes of the sun, how far away it is, how big it is, and things like this. The next thing has to do with the amount of what physicists called mass. That's just the amount of material in something. And this is something that, this is a quantity that physicists and astronomers are always very interested in. Because if you can determine the mass of something, that tells you a lot about it. If it has, uh, if it has the mass or the density of something like uh, styrofoam packing material, that tells you it's quite different than, say, something like a block of uranium would have. And the main differences between those two substances are their density. 
Now the mass of the Earth is about twice what the mass of a sphere the same size would have if it had the density of rock. So in other words, take a rock that you pick up on a river. Imagine a rock with the same, same material, the same volume as the Earth would be. The Earth has about twice as much mass. Now the reason for that, of course, is the Earth is largely made of rock, but it has a metal, an iron nickel core, which is much denser than, than rock is. And so the average density of the Earth is much higher. The Sun has about 40% more mass than a sphere the same size would have made of water. So it's less dense than the Earth is, but it's so much bigger in size that, the, uh, that its mass is, uh, is way larger than the mass of the Earth. And in fact, the mass of the Sun, which we can, me we can measure very precisely, is 300,000 times, actually 332,000 times the mass of the Earth. So it has 330,000 times as much material as the Earth does. Professor Fix at the University of Iowa, is a colleague of mine who's written a book that we use in these classes, has made the comparison that, in comparison, the comparing the mass of the Earth to that of the mass of the Sun is like the mass on one side of three NFL linebackers and on the other side of a paper clip. So it's, a, uh, it's an indicator, all these things coming together of the, the size, the distance, and the mass illustrates a very important point, which is that the Earth and everything on it, like us, is a pretty small piece of the whole solar system. Most of the action in terms of where the material is and so on is, is uh, in the case of the solar system, in the sun. In fact, most uh, everything other than the sun in the solar system is kind of like a leftover cookie dough. Now the next thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, in terms of the characteristics of the sun is its age. How old is it? How long has it been around? Now when you start talking about uh, the ages of things or people or civilizations and whatever, again it's natural to relate these to the, uh, the ages of human beings. So we're used to humans last, uh, who have a lifetime of 70 to 80 years. Or if we think on the human historical time scale, you can go back and have civilization started about 4,500 years ago. So we can say you go from the lifetimes of individual people to the lifetime of civilizations, you go up to four or 5,000 years. If we start talking about human beings as a species, we maybe go to four million years, something like that. We can, we can identify uh, primates so that uh, we think we're related to from that arose about four to five million years ago. As I say in my class with these, uh, these primates from four million years ago, that you probably wouldn't want to have a date with any of them, but that they're pretty, much, pretty clearly identifiable as us. And then finally, going even further back, if we go uh, stretching our imaginations a lot, that the extinction of the dinosaurs was 65 million years ago. So again, these are going to be very big numbers, and it's really hard to really relate to or understand what 65 million years means. Now if we get to the age of the sun and the solar system, you, uh, you, once again, things become uh, uh, very difficult to relate to. And this is a diagram, this is actually, this is a very interesting diagram that uh, comes from a paper that has to do with a comparison of the geological history of Earth and the planet Mars. And, and I'm not gonna go into this tonight. If you're intrigued by this, which you should be, enroll at the University of Iowa and take my course in astronomy and you'll hear more about it. But it's, this is to illustrate the difference between how Mars and the Earth evolved. But the point is we have now this time scale along here is in billions of years. A billion is a thousand million. And it goes from over here, which is now, to over here, which is 4.5 um, billion years. Now the, on this scale, this extinction of the dinosaurs is right over here. So it's practically, it was five minutes ago in the overall time of things. It has right here are the origin of uh, when we started having plants on land. And multicellular life on Earth began right about here. Before that, there was nothing on life on Earth except um, essentially bacteria.
Now you look on this scale, so all the life on Earth, or multicellular life, is in this period here. And here are the dinosaurs, essentially, right up next to where we are right now. Here is the uh, time scale for the whole history of the solar system. And we know the time that the solar system, the sun and the planets, formed about 4.5 billion years ago. So the sun is very distant. It's huge, it's massive, and it's just almost unimaginably old by any terrestrial standards. Now the final uh, aspect that I'd like to bring about um, in uh, talking about the, the sun is, has to do with its, uh, its brightness and so on. Why does the, why does the sun shine? It's a, a very basic question. I've always thought that the best questions one can come up with in astronomy are the ones that a three-year-old kid would ask, which are ones like, how old is the sun? Why does it shine? And things like this. Well, the, the answer is very simple. It's something that's uh, common to your everyday uh, experiences. The, uh, the uh, sun shines because it's hot, or more specifically, it, uh, it glows in the sky because the outer layers of it are at a very, very high temperature. So it shines for the same reason that the coils on the top of your electric stove shine, or why it is that a coal of charcoal that you pull out of a, uh, of a campfire shines. Now the sun is hotter than those. The surface of the sun is at a temperature of 9,900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, is extremely hot even though for those of us accustomed to uh, Iowa summers. Now on that scale, the sun is hotter than some stars and cooler than others. And, uh, and again, there is the, sort of a whole variety of stars. We can study the different types of stars like one could study different types of, of biological system. Some are hotter, some are cooler. Now, uh, in stellar astronomy, we can look out and study uh, different kinds of stars and, and try and figure out their properties, like how massive they are, how, what their diameters are, how hot they are, and so on. And there are classes that, that come into this. And this classification of the sun is G25. It's a G number two Roman, uh, uh, Roman numeral five. Now, this isn't going to be on any pop quiz at the end of the period here. And, and normally, I wouldn't introduce technical jargon. But one of the things I always point out is when you see a classification like that and say, this is the, uh, this is the form of the classification of the sun, it indicates a lot of interesting things. One is that we know an awful lot about stars, is if you can, if you can attribute those kind of precise classes to different kinds of stars. Another thing that's intriguing about this is it indicates then if we can pigeonhole the sun in this class that was set up for stars, then it gives you a tremendously profound idea that there are other stars out there in the night sky that are very, very similar to the sun. And so if there are other objects out in the, the night sky that are similar to the sun, other stars, then a natural question comes about is whether they have planets. And uh, there are probably ballpark a billion stars in our galaxy alone that are pretty similar to the sun. And some of them are almost carbon copies. So the point of the bringing in these things with these various transparencies and so on is to give a, first of all, a ballpark estimate of what is the nature of the sun and um, how big it is, why does it shine, and kind of what its overall rough physical characteristics are. When we talk about the sun, what kind of animal are we talking about? And this is, these are the, uh, um, the characteristics of it. One other thing I might mention for you, those of you in high school and taking chemistry courses is um, the composition of the sun. What's it made of? What's its recipe? Interestingly enough, 75% of the mass of the sun, 75% of every kilogram, is in the form of, uh, of the element hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest element. It's uh, never found in the atomic state. In other words, individual atoms are, are almost never in the molecular state on Earth. Um, and it wasn't really known that it existed until a couple hundred years ago where they extracted it for the first time. And in high school chemistry classes, there's a classic experiment of releasing it. But this element that's relatively rare on Earth is actually the dominant constituent of the sun and the stars as well. 
So the materials that make up the Earth are actually kind of cosmic oddballs. Most of the matter of the universe is in these elements which are relatively rare on the Earth. Okay, well that's the um, um, sort of introduction of what kind of animal we're talking about. Roger, could I have the slide back on then? Okay, so let's start talking a little bit more about the, uh, the nature of the sun. And so here's a picture of it. Here's this thing with a diameter of 865,000 miles. Now you might think, well, all that's fine and good, but it really doesn't have too much to do with us on Earth. Again, we can say, there it sits up there in all its magnificence. It shines for us. That's good. Uh, if it didn't shine, life would be impossible on the Earth. But other than that, it doesn't have much of an effect on the, uh, on the Earth. You might think that. But that's not correct. And what I'm going to spend the rest of the time this evening talking about is why it is that the things that are occurring on the, uh, on the sun are really uh, are quite important in a number of ways. Now, um, the way you can, uh, um, one of the ways of introducing this is to point out on this picture of the sun, you can see the watches here, and these are not the uh, imperfections in the slides that I brought over here or dirt on the lens. Those are actually on the surface of the sun, and these are, these are called sunspots. Now, last week there was a very large one on the, uh, on the surface of the sun, and in the last day another large group has developed. So, if you have uh, telescopes and project the images of the telescope, you can actually see these things. And they come and go. Sometimes on the sun you'll see many of them like this. There are other times when there'll be none on the sun. So these things will come and go. The scientific study of them began with Galileo. He was the, made observations with a telescope and was able to see that there were these spots on the sun. And since that time, since about the year 1620, there's been extensive studies of these things. They were actually seen before Galileo. There are records of them in Chinese chronicles of, uh, of sunspots. There when there were very large sunspots, and if you, can see if, the, if you would see the sun heavily reddened near the horizon, you can actually see them. But anyway, these are these things. If I could have the, uh, the next picture here, Roger. This is a close-up picture of one of these, uh, uh, one of the sunspots. And this is, they, uh, they often have a very kind of complex structure or appearance to them. A very general characteristic is that often there'll be a very dark inner part and then a less dark outer part of these things. But here, these often tend to come in clumps or groups together like this. You might say at the outset, the sunspots are harbingers or indicators of what I'll call solar activity, which I'll be in the process of spending a lot of time uh, uh, talking about. Now, the reason uh, sunspots are dark, there are a number of, of aspects of sunspots that are important and interesting. The reason that they're dark is that they're cooler than the surrounding surface of the sun. So what happens is that if the sun glows because it's hot, as you probably know, hotter objects glow more brightly than cooler objects. So there's a slight temperature difference. By a slight temperature means maybe 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit difference between here and here. 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit sounds like an awful lot, but remember again that the average surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees. So it's, uh, it's not as if they're stone cold. They're just slightly cooler, but that's enough to um, uh, cause a difference in the, um, in the darkness or brightness. Now these, even though looking at this picture of the sun that I showed a second ago makes them look like kind of small acne blemishes on the surface of the sun, and you might not think they're all that larger, impressive. Most sunspots like this are larger than the Earth. So again, the, uh, the Earth would go completely in a large sunspot like that. So again, we're dealing with objects that are on terrestrial scales or compared to terrestrial objects that are very large. Now, um, in understanding the characteristics of sunspots, these things are regions, in addition to being regions that are cooler than the rest of the sun, there are also regions of intense magnetism. And if we could have the next slide. And let me just turn out a couple of the lights here at the back as well to get a better look at this. One of the, um, one of the things I was telling Roger beforehand is, is many years of uh, experience in teaching the class I do illustrates that you don't want to turn the lights off in a lecture room unless absolutely necessary. It's just that there is something 
in the evolutionary history of human beings to say when the lights go out, it's time to go to sleep. Now this is a picture of the sun showing this would be a sunspot region. And you see these big loop structures there. And these are very, very common to see on the, uh, uh, in the case of the, um, of the sun. And these things, so you might look at those and you might remember things like the loops of iron filings around a bar magnet. And that would be the correct interpretation. These structures are caused by intense magnetic fields around the sunspots. In fact, the strength of the magnetic fields around sunspots are as strong as the magnet, uh, magnetic fields around electromagnets. So if you look at sometimes seeing industrial electromagnets picking up junk, it's obviously an extremely strong field. The magnetic field in the vicinity of some of these sunspots gets, uh, well, that's kind of a typical value, is uh, of the same order of strength. And this magnetism is tied up in a complicated way with the structure of sunspots and why they're dark ra rather than, uh, than uh, instead of being bright. Now, um, sometimes the um, energy in these magnetic fields is released catastrophically in, uh, in big explosions. And these explosions are called solar flares. Now one of the ways you might, I might explain that is that the uh, magnetic fields are generated by currents. Again, if you think of electromagnets, you have to have coils carrying a lot of electrical current. Now if you have big systems carrying electrical current, you might know that if you would suddenly disrupt those, you can release a lot of energy. The, uh, the, con the example that comes to mind is that if you look at uh, uh, transformer lines getting knocked down in a storm, there are big, big uh, pops and, sand, uh, and explosions and fires of various sorts because the energy that was contained in the flowing electrical current in the magnetic field has changed into kinetic energy. That happens in the sun, too, in these, uh, in these sunspots. Every once in a while, sort of like an earthquake going off, there'll be uh, energy that's in these magnetic fields will be released, and these produces things called solar flares. Can I have the next picture here, Roger? Here is a picture of a solar flare, and uh, this is probably a little bit hard to see exactly what's going on, but here what you can see is, uh, is a sunspot group. And then this thing that looks like a rip in the picture is not a rip in the picture at all. It's a brilliant glowing couple of ribbons. So what happens in a solar flare is that you see this tremendously brilliant glowing thing that usually will go on for half a minute or a minute or several minutes and then die away again in the, uh, and it releases a huge amount of energy. The amount of energy that's released in these things can be as much, we can do a pretty good job of measuring how much energy is released in solar flares, and it goes up to being as much as 100 billion atomic bombs worth of energy. So again, uh, it illustrates just how big things associated with the sun are, and it also uh, makes you glad that they're happening there and not here. Now another interesting um, ramification of, stellar act or of solar activity um, can be illustrated if you would look at the sun, not with uh, visible light uh, that our eyes are sensitive to, but instead with x-rays. Now this is something that wasn't possible until about 20 years ago. As I was saying in Roger's class about an hour ago, is when we look up at the, uh, the sky with our eyes, we're seeing ra what's called electromagnetic radiation, or light, with a very narrow range of wavelengths. About, uh, it's about uh, 500 thousandth of a centimeter in, in wavelength. Now if we would look at the sky with x-ray wavelengths, so somehow that your eyes were sensitive to x-rays, but otherwise you had a normal social life, you would see a uh, quite different view of the universe, and you'd see a quite different view of the sun as well. Could I have the next slide, Roger? This is a picture of what the sun looks like at x-ray wavelengths. This is a, uh, an image uh, given by a Japanese satellite called Yoko. Here is the disk of the sun like this. And what you can see is that most of the solar surface is dark. It's not shining at x-ray wavelengths. But there's some regions where you can see these very bright glowing regions, and it usually occurs in a band around the sun. And these are associated uh, very strongly with regions where you have sunspots. 
So when you look at the, um, the sun as revealed by um, the characteristics of these explosions, these solar flares, when you look at the parts of the sun that are shining at x-rays rather than normal light, you begin to see a, uh, a much more active kind of seething object than you do just at uh, visible wavelengths. Now I might say, and I've sort of mentioned this again, but just let me emphasize one more time, sunspots kind of underlie the whole basis of solar activity. They're good indicators of the sun being active and doing things for us. So it's of a good deal of interest to um, study those and to try and understand them as best we can, or at least to be able to see what their characteristics are. Now there's some very interesting aspects of sunspots. Um, I showed uh, here a picture of the disk of the sun, and, uh, and you could see a number of these things. And I said that sometimes you'd have a lot of very large sunspots, other times there'd be none there at all. So it's kind of like the weather, it comes and goes. And this was sort of thought for a long time to be the case, that, um, um, that it was just kind of changeable like the weather from one day to the next. Now in the middle of the 19th century, there was an important discovery made. It was, a, uh, it was made by a, a German astronomer named Schwabe, and he was a guy who had to work at night, but was interested in astronomy. And he asked an astronomer once, what kind of observations can I do that would be important to astronomy that, uh, that I can do during the daytime? Well, you might say the answer to that would be none, because during the daytime, obviously, the sun's up. You can't see the stars or planets. So what the astronomer uh, said was to, or did, was to suggest some observations about the sun that would be interesting. So he said, why don't you count the sunspots, make very careful measurements, of the number of sunspots and big ones versus little ones, and let's see what that looks like. Now, he made a very interesting, very important discovery, which is illustrated here. I think I'll turn these lights back on. There we go. Now, what this is, is there, it's a remarkable kind of plot and is um, relevant to this, uh, this whole issue of the effect of the, um, of the sun on the Earth. Now what this is, is this is a plot with uh, many, many years worth of observations on it. This runs you from the scale here is 1950 up to 1998 right there. So this is, uh, this is going over almost 50 years now worth of data. And over here, what we have plotted is the average number of sunspots on the, uh, the sun in a given month. So you just go and count the number of sunspots on the, uh, the sun every day, and you average that number for a month and just plot it up on this piece of graph paper. Now what you might think is you get just some kind of random thing like some uh, chicken scratching on the graph paper, but you don't get that at all. What you can see is that there is this dominant periodicity to the sun's activity. The, uh, the sun has sort of a heartbeat of sort. In other words, the activity on the sun comes and goes, comes and goes, with a very well-defined period. This period is 11 years and is referred to as the 11-year solar cycle. Now what happens is that a so-called solar maximum, which are these, uh, these regions here where the sunspot numbers are very high, you also tend to get a lot of these things called solar flares and a lot of the other phenomena we'll be talking about a little bit later, where the sun has a big effect on the Earth and the other planets. During times of solar minimum, which is down around here, you have smaller numbers of sunspots and, um, and uh, correspondingly fewer flares, fewer incidents where the, uh, the sun affects all of interplanetary space. Now on this time scale, there's a couple of things worth pointing out. This plot went up to about 1997 or 1998 right now. The sunspot number is ba has bottomed out and is coming up now. So the, actually the next solar maximum or time when the sunspot number is going to be a maximum is going to be around the year 2001 and 2002. And you can count on it. In other words, it's not something like some kind of predicting winning the lottery. We have enough data now over time that we absolutely know the sun will be in this high mode of activity in another uh, three or four years.
As you can see from this, some sunspot maxima are more active than others. This one was a bit low, this one was a bit high, and we know that there were other ones in the past which were higher still. But a maximum will certainly occur. So at any rate, there are two interesting things about this diagram. One is to point out where we are right now. The other is an interesting point that, uh, that I always like to make in terms of the space program, uh, science, and space exploration, which is if you look here on, this is 1960, 1961. Uh, 1961 was the year that President Kennedy made this famous uh, uh, commitment to send people to the moon and return them safely. The first part was easy to do, the second part was the trick. Uh, within the decade of the 1960s. So this was made for political and not scientific reasons. And evidently one of the things he didn't, uh, didn't take into account was that prediction was made in 1961. Within the decade of the 1960s goes up to here. We didn't have the capability then, so he had to develop it. So it's pretty clear from the outset that if this worked at all, it was going to arrive back, to, it was going to arrive right at the end of the decade of the 60s which you can see was right on the top of uh, solar maximum. Now, as I'll mention a little bit later, in solar maximum you have these flares. They often fill space with uh, radiation that can be lethal. So if you were going to send, pick a time to send uh, people out into outer space, the period of solar maximum is absolutely the worst time you could choose. Now, it turns out that none of the Apollo missions got caught in, uh, in deep space, I don't know what we call the solar wind, uh, during a huge solar flare, but it could very easily have happened. Okay, so that's a um, kind of a description of, first of all, what the nature of the sun is and what kind of uh, forms of activity does it have. Now, um, one could say, and, what, and people did say for quite a long time, was that that's all fine and interesting, but there still isn't any evidence of a solar effect on the Earth. And um, the reason why people believe for a long time that the sun could sit there and have it, it could have its sunspots and it could have its solar flares and so on, that still couldn't affect conditions on Earth. This was thought for a long time. We know, now know that to be wrong. Now let me describe why it is that, that, uh, that why it was it was believed to be the case for a long time and why we now know that that's not correct. The sun, as we've just said, is 93 million miles away. That's a long distance. For a long time, it was believed that interplanetary space, the space between the Earth and the other planets, was a complete vacuum, completely empty. Now, if you have a vacuum between an object here and an object here, it's very difficult for this object to do anything nasty to this object here. So, for example, uh, you could have earthquakes in Alaska, and people in Hawaii wouldn't have to worry if there weren't an ocean. The ocean is a medium through which waves can travel. Waves can carry energy. The reason why earthquakes in, the, in Alaska can be are dangerous for the Hawaiian Islands is you have a huge amount of energy released here. It produces these tsunamis, which are big waves that carry a lot of energy, propagate across the open ocean, and impact on the, uh, the coast of Hawaii. The same thing with earthquakes. If you just had a lot of energy released in the middle of the earth and there were no medium to carry the wave energy, the cities in California would have no problem. But because there's a solid Earth that can carry waves, then they are a problem to cities tens or hundreds of miles away. And again, it's, uh, we have an illustration right here. If we're a vacuum between me and you, I could sit and make all the noise I want and it wouldn't bother you in the least. It would be very easy to go to sleep. So the presence of media, a uh, solid medium or a gaseous medium that can carry waves, is a very effective way for being able to transmit energy from one place to the next. Now, as I said, for a long time, uh, even up till, up till about 40 years ago, people didn't think there was such a medium. You look out in space at night, and space looks very empty. It seems that the space between the planets is extremely uh, empty. Now, over a period of decades in this century, it began to be clear uh, to more and more scientists that 
Uh, space, although pretty tenuous, was not completely empty. And if I could have the next slide here, Roger. Now, there, are, um, there were a number of indications of this. And let me just sort of go through some of these. Um, no, that's not the one I want. This is a picture of the sun in, um, in eclipse. So this is a total eclipse of the sun. A uh, total eclipse of the sun is when the moon moves in front of the, uh, from the sun and blocks out its light. Now, these are very beautiful phenomena to see. I've seen only one in my life. I'd like to see more. And they're very beautiful because surrounding the sun, you can see this kind of milky, nebulous glow. The name for this is the corona. Corona is a Latin word for crown. And in antiquity, people saw this and saw this sort of crown of light around the, uh, around the sun. Now, we now know that uh, this um, glowing material here is the outer atmosphere of the sun. It's the highest level of the, uh, the sun's atmosphere. And what's happening, the material in the, uh, the outer atmosphere of the sun is reflecting sunlight, which is down here obscured by the moon, reflected sunlight out towards us where we can see it. So it's very similar how to often at sunset you can see reflected light from high clouds even after the sun has gone down. So in this case, these aren't really clouds in the sense of terrestrial clouds, but there is matter out there, electrons, that can scatter or reflect the light towards us. Now, what was realized um, a few decades ago is that this corona is extremely hot. It's many millions of degrees Fahrenheit. And that's an absolute, we know the temperature of the corona as well as we know the, uh, as you know the temperature in your oven when you're baking a cake. So it's not speculative at all. So what this is, this outer atmosphere of the sun is extremely high temperatures. Could I uh, have the next slide here, Roger? Here are other pictures of the corona and other eclipses. You can all see these beautiful kind of teardrop shaped structures like this. Uh, often there are areas where it's very dark, which indicates that those are, uh, that there isn't much matter to reflect light there. Those are called coronal holes. And, um, uh, but anyway, again, you can see this, uh, this structure here in the corona and it changes this, the corona will appear different at times of this solar maximum and times of solar minimum. Uh, when there are few sunspots on the surface of the sun, at a time like solar minimum, the corona almost always looks something like this. Could I have the next slide, Roger? Uh, at times of solar maximum, it's much more symmetric, or in other words, equally bright in all directions. So it changes, it has its own life cycle. It's, it's, uh, it's connected and knows about the sunspots. But the main feature here is that this, uh, uh, the corona is at this very, very high temperature. Now high temperature gases want to expand. That's the, uh, the basic uh, operating principle, the internal combustion engine. You ignite gasoline, it releases its energy. The gas heats up and it expands and drives the piston of your, pistons of your car. So similarly, the corona, being so hot, wants to expand out into space, and it does that. So there is, and people started realizing this earlier in the century, that the corona is actually the beginning, or the source, or the base, of a flow, a tenuous flow of gas out through space, which is called the solar wind. So the solar wind is like a flow or a breeze, well, it's actually a wind that comes out from the sun and flows out through space, past the orbit of the Earth, and in fact out as far as we've been able to measure. Now this solar wind is a, is a remarkable object in its own right. Um, in describing its properties, I'd like to say a little bit about its, uh, its uh, density. Um, and also to just indicate that the people that for a long time didn't believe there was anything there at all weren't a, uh, weren't a bunch of fools. Um, let me describe what, uh, what I mean by the low density of the solar wind, or describe a little bit about its characteristics. Um, in this room, there is, uh, there's of course air. And we could indicate what the, uh, the density of the air is by uh, the number of atoms per cubic centimeter. So in other words, if I took a little uh, glass box about the size of a sugar cube, 
I could ask how many atoms of nitrogen and oxygen are in there. Well, that turns out to be a number of about 4 times 10 to the 19th. Now, that's scientific notation. Uh, the high school students, at least the juniors and seniors, uh, will or should know what that number means. But let me describe 4 times 10 to the 19th. I mean, if I was going to write this down on a piece of paper, I would write 4 and 19 zeros after it. So 4 million would be 4 with 6 zeros. This is 4 with 19 zeros, and that is the number of atoms in the air in this room in a volume about the size of a sugar cube. It's an amazing fact. Now, um, in the solar wind, things are quite different. These are uh, measurements that are actually made in the solar wind right now by a spacecraft called SOHO. SOHO is a spacecraft that launched about two years ago and it's out in space and it observes the sun all the, uh, all the time. It's a couple million miles towards the sun from where we are. Now, um, this, is, uh, this picture here shows one of the advantages of the internet. I tend to believe, by and large, that computers and the internet are grossly exaggerated from the point of view of their educational effects, but there are places where they come in handy and this is one of them. This SOHO has its data listed, this uh, spacecraft, also has an instrument that measures the characteristics of the solar wind there. And it radios this down to Earth and it's put on a website. And you can look this up and see more or less what the weather conditions in the solar wind are up to a few minutes ago. And this is a plot I made a few days ago. So this is two days worth of data from April 2nd to into April 4th, that's of this year, so two, two days ago. So this is 48 hours. And what we have here is the solar wind speed and its density and the number of atoms per cubic centimeter. So this is a direct measurement with this instrument. And what you see is the density of material in the solar wind is not 4 with 19 zeros after it, but it ranges between 5 to 10, and on the, on when it gets really dense, it's maybe 15 atoms per cubic centimeter. 19 powers of 10 less dense. It's in fact kind of amazing that you could even measure that. The speed of the solar wind is between 350 and about 500 kilometers per second. That's about 180 to 300 miles per second. So it's, uh, if I could uh, hitch a ride on the solar wind, Getting back to Iowa City tonight would take me about one second, which would be kind of convenient. So this, uh, the solar wind is a very tenuous but very high speed uh, flow. So at any rate, it's, it's remarkable. Now, again, shows a lot of these things that uh, show the progress that we've been able to make in science in my lifetime. When I was first got interested in the space program about 1960, people weren't even sure that this existed. Now you can get onto your computer and see what the conditions have been in the last, uh, um, the last few minutes. Now what this solar wind does, it has a very important effect. Essentially what it does is to provide this connected medium between the, um, um, between the sun and the earth. And this is illustrated in this picture here, which is uh, uh, from a book written by uh, Professor John Fix, a colleague of mine at Iowa. And what this shows is here is the Earth with the Earth's magnetic field, and here is the solar wind. And so what happens is that there's a big flow of the solar wind around the Earth, much like you have a flow of wind around a, a, an airplane wing. And so this is the normal configuration. The sort of the border between the Earth and interplanetary space is determined by this balance between, on one hand, essentially the drag force of the solar wind, and on the other hand, by the Earth's magnetic field wanting to expand out into space. So what we then have is this here, where you have the solar wind, you have this medium, or this atmosphere, uh, that can carry waves between the sun and the Earth. Now most of the time, the solar wind is pretty steady or slowly changing, so this equilibrium changes very slowly. And we don't see much in the way of effects. But once in a while, things change, and there can be violent, act, uh, violent events on the sun. We talked about one of these as solar flares, of these big super A-bomb explosions on the sun. Another is a kind of phenomenon called a coronal mass ejection. If I could have the next slide, Roger. <coughs> 
Now here is a picture of a solar uh, coronal mass ejection in progress. What would happen is this is one picture. If you had watched these things over a period of several hours, you would see a region kind of like this, thin out into this two-loop structure, and that this two-loop structure would suddenly expand out into space at very high speeds. These speeds are of the order of probably 800 to 1,000 miles a second. So it's essentially, it isn't entirely understood how it is that the sun has these things. Uh, suddenly uh, shows this matter form, these two loops, and flip out into space. But the effect on the solar wind is like if you drove a piston into it. It generates a big shock wave, and this propagates uh, through the solar wind to the Earth very much, very, in a very similar way to the way a tsunami uh, propagates uh, from someplace like Alaska through the ocean to the Hawaiian Islands. Now when that happens, there is then just like a hammer blow hitting the, uh, the Earth solar wind system. There's a term for this called the magnetosphere. But then instead of having this nice balanced system, you suddenly have a sudden hit the system and the system then, then uh, reacts, the whole Earth and its magnetic field starts readjusting and there's a lot of energy released in the, pro in the process. Now the way this happens, what happens at these times is a fair, fairly uh, common phenomenon. If we could have the next slide, Roger. This is what happens, uh, could we focus that? This is an example, it's an aurora. And uh, auroras are caused by um, particles called electrons coming streaming in from deep space and hitting on the Earth's atmosphere. So what's going on in this picture is very similar to what happens on your television set. In your television set, the electronics uh, speeds up electrons to high speeds. They hit the phosphor and the phosphor glows and you see some light. In the case of an aurora, when the um, uh, some kind of disturbance in the solar wind impacts the Earth's magnetosphere. It then accelerates electrons and they come down into the Earth's atmosphere, hit the gases in the Earth's atmosphere, and they glow. So these things are then an indication of a lot of energy release and, it, and uh, processes going on in the part of space controlled by the Earth. Could I have the next slide, Roger? This is another picture of a green aurora. Shows sort of a, of a, a loop or an oval there. Could I have one more, uh, the last slide? And then this is actually a picture taken from outer space of the Earth showing the, uh, the auroral oval. This is a picture from the, uh, the instrument of Dr. Lewis Frank of the University of Iowa. And it's a spacecraft out in space looking back at the Earth. Here is the sunlight par sunlit part of the Earth. And then you can see in the dark side there is this glow in this oval and that's where the aurora are going on. So some kind of aurora is a normal activity. But when you have these explosive events on the sun, um, these things uh, can become much more pronounced. So this is one of the um, uh, major ways in which the sun can uh, affect uh, the Earth is via, the, via these disturbances going through interplanetary space. Now, uh, there's a whole host of important phenomena that happen this way. One of them is the existence of the aurora. Uh, other things is when the Earth's atmosphere is disturbed by these events, it can inhibit radio communication. So you can get anomalies on radio communication. The shortwave communications can't occur that normally occur. There are uh, power grid failures. The large currents begin flowing in power distribution systems. There have been a number of cases in um, um, uh, known through the years where there's been millions of dollars worth of damage to power systems of, of this sort. As I mentioned a little bit earlier in the context of the Apollo program, uh, when the solar flares occur, you'll get a large amount of lethal radiation in space, which can imperil astronauts if they're up there. Or it can also damage unmanned spacecraft, even if astronauts are not there. So this is one of the, uh, one of the important ways in which the um, um, sun and its activity can influence the, uh, the Earth. Now there's another way as well, which I'd like to end up the talk by, talk, uh, by discussing.
and is one which in many ways is uh, more intriguing and potentially more important. Um, the Earth and everything on the Earth is very dependent on the Sun. In other words, all energy that we see on the Earth is a, a direct or indirect consequence of, the, uh, of sunshine. Uh, things like, for instance, fossil fuels, of course, are the, uh, the remains of plants that absorbed solar energy millions of years ago. The Earth's temperature is determined by an equilibrium of sunlight coming in and, and radiation radiated out into space. And as one of the things that the uh, discussion on global warming over the last few years has rendered uh, very clear, is that it's a very delicate balance. In other words, if the sun's radiation were to change by even a little bit, and by a little bit I mean a percent or two, either way it would have drastic effects on, on the whole nature of the Earth climate. So one had better, uh, one had better hope that the sun stays relatively constant in terms of, its, uh, of the light that it emits like in a light bulb. Now one of the things that's been discovered or realized in the last few years, last few, actually a couple decades, is that at some level the sun is actually a variable star. Is when you study astronomy there are many, many kinds of uh, variable stars. They change in their brightness. If anyone here is an amateur astronomer, you know the, uh, that there are many kinds of these things. Some, some of them change their brightness by a factor of 100 or so. If the sun did things like that, we would be completely, it'd be hopeless for life on Earth. Now what's been realized is that the sun is pretty steady, but it's not totally steady. And this is an interesting illustration of something called the Maunder Minimum. And what I showed a little bit earlier was the, uh, the sunspot cycle. So this is 1980 here and 1620 there. And again, six starts at 1620 uh, is roughly when I think Galileo's first report of sunspots was in 1610. So it starts in about the time of Galileo and goes up to the, uh, the 1980s. And what you can see is here are the solar, last few solar cycles, the 1979, 1968, 1957, and so on. People have been able to piece together the data going back a very, very long time. And as I mentioned before, you can see that the solar maximum comes and goes. There are some times when it's definitely a lot lower than at other times. So you might say, what's going on here? There's some kind of inconstancy in the sun. There's this 11-year cycle, but there's something else going on that is modulating that. Now what was found, uh, what was realized about 20 years ago, is that there was a time starting in the early 1700s and throughout most of the 1600s, when evidently the sun stopped producing spots for a while, so that the numbers, the sun spots almost totally disappeared. So for a long time, this was, these records were known for a long time, but what wasn't sure was that this was, whether this was an actual phenomenon. Now they know it is. So the sun essentially turned off as a spot producer for a period of almost a century. That was also a time when observations showed that the corona almost entirely disappeared. And there's also evidence that the sun was actually dimmer during that time because there were extremely cold winters in places like northern Europe throughout that period of time. So it's pretty clear that this Maunder minimum is an indication of solar variability on time scales of centuries or so. Now, what causes this is not understood at all. We barely understand, well, we, in fact, we don't understand what causes the 11-year solar cycle. What causes this isn't clear at all, but we'd like to know, because if it does something like this again in the future, which is very likely, in a planet that has 10 billion people on it, it could have very serious effects. So at any rate, to, to uh, wrap things up, um, what I've uh, wanted to do tonight is to give um, a description of what the overall characteristics of the sun are as an astronomical object of why it is an interesting dynamic object um, having its own personality conflicts, essentially flares and coronal mass ejections and so on, that can affect the Earth because of the existence of the solar wind. And then finally, just touch on this fact that the sun, which is the source of all energy on Earth, and it uh, determines the nature of the climate, 
is itself a slightly fitful, flickering kind of lamp. And uh, at the present time, as we approach the next solar maximum in the next uh, three to four years, it will be interesting to see what kind of phenomena the sun has in store for us. That's all I have to say. I'd be certainly happy to answer any questions people would have, either publicly here or afterwards, if you want to talk to me. So thank you very much for your attention. close to being perfectly round. I mean, ob as, um, objects uh, in the solar system bigger than a certain size or sphere. But it's actually a very good question um, because uh, objects in the solar system that have diameters less than about 500 miles aren't massive enough to deform under their own gravity. It's essentially the force of gravity. If gravity is an important uh, agent in pulling a thing together, Gravity wants to have spherical object, uh, spherically shaped objects. That's kind of a lowest energy consider, uh, lowest energy configuration. It's non-spherical. It will tend to fall, or it just in the way if I would step off this stage, I would fall towards the center of the Earth. If gravity is important, you have something like that. It's going to want to relax it to something like this. So if an object is big enough and massive enough, gravity is strong enough to force it into a spherical shape. Obviously, a brick is not massive enough to force itself into a sphere. And the, the reason then is that what we'll call solid state or the forces associated with the structure of matter are strong enough and gravity is too weak, so it doesn't force it into a sphere. But um, if you look at objects in the solar system, there's actually a fairly sharp turnover at about a diameter of about 500 miles. In other words, things Below about 500 miles usually look like rocks or lumps of coal. Things much bigger than 500 miles are pretty close to spherical. Well then, of course, if you see a sphere, if you're looking, you, you can't get out and look around and say, aha, that's a sphere. If you see a sphere and you only see it in two dimensions, it looks circular. So that's why the moon appears circular and, and why the sun appears circular even more. Something like some of the small moons of Jupiter are not spherical because they're not big enough and their gravity isn't strong enough. The remarkable thing is that even though the sun and the moon are so vastly different in size, I mean the moon is about a quarter of the diameter of the Earth, that the ratio of their distances are exactly what the ratio of their diameters are. So they're the same angle on the sky. So when the moon moves in front of the sun, it just neatly covers it up. It's kind of amazing that it's that way. That's actually a good question. You, you read yeah. in popular literature and stuff that the sun's going to die in five billion years. Mm -hmm. Is that is it going to die because of the matter and mass it's ejecting through into the solar wind, or is it because it's using up, uh, you know, converting all the, the hydrogen into You've got the answer. You, you'll get an A plus in my course. It's the, uh, it's the using up all the fuel in the center. In other words, I didn't talk at all about um, how the sun gets its energy. In other words, it radiates because it's hot. But genuinely, you uh, might say, why doesn't it cool off and grow dimmer? The reason for that is that there is an energy source in the very center which has temperatures. We estimate the temperature of the center of the sun is like 15 million degrees and there's a flow of energy out. So you have to have a furnace in the middle of the sun. That's due to nuclear reactions. And so the, the, when you look up at the sun, it's a hydrogen bomb under control. It works under exactly the same principle that hydrogen bombs do. Uh, and it's held together because of the force of gravity. But on a time scale of 10 billion years, you take a star like the sun and it burns up all its fuel in the center. And then it adjusts by starting to burn hydrogen in a shell around the core, and at that time the whole thing expands. So it's running out of gas will be the case. If you could somehow get a star that, that wouldn't run out of fuel, how, like the sun, how long would it last with the matter it's ejecting before? Okay, before that's a good question too. In the case of the, uh, in the case of the sun, that would be. Um, 
that would be several hundred billion years. It's the sun is actually the um, the mass flux from the sun is almost ex is of the order of magnitude of what the um, um, the mass flux of the Amazon River is. So that's big by terrestrial standards, but it isn't um, it isn't enough to um, make a big effect on the sun. The sun loses about uh, 1,000 billionth of its mass every year, so that takes a very long time to do it. There are other stars that lose about a millionth of their total mass every year in the form of a wind, and so a million years is a fairly short time scale for, uh, for a star, so in many of those kind of stars, and in fact, uh, Professor Leanne Wilson at Iowa State is, a, is an expert on this. In those stars, the winds really affect the revolution. So in other words, they end up um, behaving in a different way because of these winds than they would if they didn't have the winds. But in the case of the sun, even though the solar wind is important for having this essentially link between us and, uh, and it, it doesn't affect the internal dynamics of the sun. Does that make sense or not? Yeah. Okay. Um, if it's true that um, the sun's supposed to like be the life cycle of the low mass star, um, uh, I guess the sun's supposed to turn into a red giant. That's right. Um, if, like, like, if humans are like still on Earth, like, what would take place? Like, how would that be? The Earth will be uh, swallowed up by the sun because it will begin expanding, getting larger in diameter and cooler or reddish, and eventually the outer layers of the sun will go out and pass the orbit of the Earth. So the Earth would actually find itself inside the sun, and that will do things like vaporize the oceans and the atmosphere and things like that. So if human beings uh, lived to that time, then they'd have to move somewhere else. And this thing about the sun expanding in five billion years and swallowing the Earth, Sounds like a pretty incredible prediction. But we can look out in space and see objects like that. We can see stars called the red giant stars and red super giant stars. And it's completely clear that they are a part of a life cycle. In other words, that they're evolutionarily connected to stars like the sun. So uh, in the remote future, it's going to be bad news for the, uh, uh, for the Earth. But in my case, five billion years is interesting to think about in terms of astronomy, but I don't let it worry, I don't get worried about the sociological consequences of it. But it is interesting to think about. Yeah? Um, if when the sun starts to expand and when it runs out of mm -hmm. Expand, it's going to shrink in on itself. It, uh, well, what happens, the, the, the life cycle, and again, we can see examples of all this, is that it's the outer layers that expand. Most of the mass of the sun will still be at the very center, but the outer layers will expand. And eventually, these, these, they'll just keep expanding, and they'll, they'll go out into space. Uh, and you'll leave this very dense, very small core at the center, which will be the remnant where most of the actual, uh, most of the atoms that presently form the sun will remain there. So that the, after this red giant and red supergiant phase, the, the, uh, the sun will essentially throw off its outer envelopes. We can see objects like that. They're called planetary nebulae, and there are hundreds of them known, and you can see that there are objects that are actually stars in the process of throwing off the uh, throwing off their outer layers and leaving these cores, which are very massive, meaning they have about as much stuff in them as a star, but they're very small in size. And the size of these cores that are left over are only about the size of the Earth, so it'll be about one hundredth the size of the present day sun. Now, again, this might sound like some kind of yarn that you're sp uh, sp uh, that I'm sitting up here and telling all this science fiction stuff. But again, those stars are called white dwarf stars, and, uh, and we know of, again, hundreds of examples of these things. And so the, the bright star Sirius, if any of you have learned any of the constellations, Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. It's the one you'll see in the sky in the southwest skies these evenings. And it has a companion star, which is a white dwarf. So they're very common. A couple of the nearest stars have uh, companions, which are white dwarfs. So that's what the sun is going to end up 
several billion years in the future is that most of the mass will be in an object about one hundredth of its present diameter. Yeah. In our class, we just been we just got done talking about the life cycle of stars and the death of stars, and uh, we didn't talk anything about supernovas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Supernovae are the end. What um, the there's sort of an end game for stars. In other words, they're sort of the end products of stellar evolution. And there are kind of two routes you can take, and the routes you take depend on how massive the star is. And if it's what's called a low mass star, and low mass star means something like the sun. There are a lot of stars that have 20 or 30 or 50 times as much mass as the sun does. If it's a star like the sun, it ends up going through the red giant, red supergiant, the planetary nebula phase, and ends up as a white dwarf. And again, we can see examples of stars doing this. Uh, what happens with a massive star is at the end, it goes through the red giant, red supergiant phase. But what happens is that this interior, where most of the mass is, never is able to find an equilibrium, and it collapses on itself. And when it collapses on itself, it creates a huge amount of energy, so that for a bright, uh, for a short amount of time, this would be ex the radiation released in this collapse can shine as brightly as all the rest of the stars in the galaxy, and that's called a supernova. But that will only occur if stars are something like eight to ten times as massive as the sun is. If they're less massive than that, then they don't do that; they go the white dwarf route. And again, this is all completely well-established observation because we can see these supernovae going off in other galaxies. There are historical records of them occurring in, in, uh, in our galaxy. From the number of them that we can see, we can figure out what fraction of stars do this, and, and it's the only the very massive ones. So it's kind of like a, you come to a fork in the road in, in uh, stellar evolution after the, the life cycle that the sun is. And if you're a low mass star, you end up with this fairly peaceful end of a white dwarf. And if it's a high mass star, it has this big firecracker at the end of its life. That's next week. <laughs> we talk about That's when the pulsars, it produces pulsars. I'd like to say, uh, uh, before, uh, before this, we uh, met in my classroom, and we had a double feature. Not only was Dr. Spangler here, but uh, a, a young friend of mine uh, who's in the audience, and I'd like to introduce him. He's uh, Michael Boggs. He's a homegrown product here. He graduated from uh, Marshalltown High School in 1984, and he'll graduate from ISU uh, this spring in uh, aeronautical engineering, right, Mike? Aerospace engineering. Aerospace engineering, excuse me. And I asked him to come tonight because it kind of fits in with this, uh, ast astronomy and, ast and aerospace engineering. And uh, uh, Michael has had uh, two appointments with uh, NASA. Uh, he's been to Russia uh, once, and you're going to go again this summer? Yep. Uh, he has uh, worked uh, with closely with uh, Dr. Sally Wright, the first woman astronaut, and uh, he was also, also one of my little league baseball players a year ago, <laughs> uh, several, a few years ago, and he's done quite well. I'd like to introduce, uh, uh, he, he added some uh, interesting uh, observations to our class, and Michael stand up, please. Michael Ball. Thank you so very much for coming, and uh, that was quite interesting. My pleasure. Yes. Uh, I'm sure that he'll uh, hang around here a bit before he goes back to Iowa City, and if you have uh, questions, uh, uh, feel free to ask. One, one other thing, I'm going to put on this desk up here, uh, or not desk, but uh, table. 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 where my briefcase is, some uh, brochures that uh, Dr. Spangler brought along from the University of Iowa, uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, take a few of those. If you want more, you'd be glad to uh, uh, send more, or you can get in touch with me here. Uh, Roger Stevens is my name. 
uh, at uh, MCC, or you can call me uh, even at the Apple Telephone Directory, and uh, I can put you on at him, and we'll get the necessary information that you might. Uh, take a look at it, and I'll spread them out. Michael, would you mind kind of separating those uh, pamphlets uh, that way? I appreciate that. If there's no other uh, thing then, uh, thanks for coming to the seventh annual. I'll see you next year at the eighth annual.